mm-hmm. that we can be aware of. And the first one he said was the concubine. What is oh, okay. what was that um, big concubi- word? <laughs> concupiscence, <laughs> concupiscence, and he's a it's concus <laughs> How does he say it? <laughs> concusable appetite. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Concusable. <laughs> I'm asking you. It's like concusable. <laughs> I'm gonna actually look it up. Um. <laughs> Do you pronounce? I can't, I can't even spell it. Concu... Concusible? <laughs> oh, here it is. Concupiscible. Um, here, they do have it. YouTube does have it. Oh, concu... Oh, no. <laughs> Concupiscible. Concupiscible. Okay, perfect. Okay. 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 Right. <laughs> wow. Welcome back to the Modern Lady Podcast. You're listening to episode 114. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lindsay. And today we are talking about detachment. Early 14th century German theologian Meister Eckhart once said, quote, He who would be serene and pure needs but one thing, detachment. End quote. Ah, purity and serenity. Wouldn't we all love our lives and our world to be full of such things? But if detachment is the path, then we will need to start there. And though it's not always the easy way, it is a practice that is necessary. But first, this podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. How about you? Do you want more from The Modern Lady? Become a Patreon supporter, and for just $5 a month, you will have access to extra content. Find us by going to patreon.com forward slash The Modern Lady Podcast. You can also support the show by giving us a rating and review on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. Your reviews, especially on iTunes, can really help others who might be interested find our podcast too. Your comments mean the world to us. This week's shout out goes to Elisa Carlson, who sent us an email and said, quote, Dear Lindsay and Michelle, thank you for being my favorite podcast and for all the work you do behind the scenes to compile such encouraging episodes. The Homemaker's Creed episode is one of my favorites, and I even found a printable of the Creed online after you introduced me to it, which now hangs framed near my kitchen sink, end quote. Well, thank you so much, Elisa, for sending us an email and for sharing that about how you hung the Homemaker's Creed in your kitchen. We loved that. Thank you for supporting us. It really means so much to know that you're enjoying the podcast. And if you would like to leave us a comment, you can do so on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com, or you can leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, where you can find us at The Modern Lady Podcast. But before we get into today's chat, Lindsay has our Modern Lady Tip of the Week. Tis the most social time of the year. (laughs) So this got me thinking about hostess gifts. And I figured that it was high time to find out what the top hostess gifts of 2021 are. So according to Town & Country Magazine, some of the items that they recommend are cocktail napkins, and then a really neat book that I have now put on my Amazon wish list called The Encyclopedia of the Exquisite. And it looks so neat. What a great gift to give somebody. And they also recommend a recipe journal. So you can jot down what you've loved cooking, make notes, kind of, you know, gather your other recipes that you've cut out and put it in there as well. And then things took an expensive turn when they recommended buying your, like as a hostess gift, the Crosley record player or a room spray that costs $250. (laughs) So then I turned to the queen herself, Martha Stewart, and on her website, she has a best and worst hostess gifts for 2021 article, and she suggests personalized gifts. She says they're very thoughtful and lovely, and that a personalized gift really goes that extra mile. Now, there are lots of ways to get things personalized now via Amazon, Etsy, and even Costco. Martha suggested home items like candles or a plant, but advises against flowers. And we've talked about this before on the podcast, but she just says again that they can be tricky due to allergies. And she said, and I didn't know this, that some flowers can have negative cultural connotations. 
A few more suggestions from her website included a nice puzzle, a jar of local honey, good quality olive oil, an apron, a whimsical butter dish, artisanal soaps, or a personal favorite of ours, a really nice bottle of liqueur, or we like to give cream liqueurs. Uh, it's those sugary, really fun ones that we only drink them at Christmas. And our favorite last year was from a local Ontario distillery called Forty Creek, and it was Nanaimo Bar flavored and oh so delicious. So before I draw this tip to a close though, do not be intimidated by the idea of a hostess gift. Like many of you, we are often on a budget and sometimes all I can bring is pretty paper napkins and sometimes I can't bring anything at all. It isn't the gift that the hosts are looking forward to. It's your presence. So accept the invitation and be truly thankful because that is always the best gift. Mm. Well, I'm very intrigued by that Encyclopedia of the Exquisite. Uh huh. Uh-huh. What a title. I'm going right? to have to it's, look it up. Yeah. Exactly. I stopped exa- what I was doing immediately. I looked it up on Amazon. I moved it into my wish list <laughs> and I will send <laughs> said wish list to husband. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Oh, I didn't know you could send wish lists to husbands. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I'll have to do that too. Um, when we bring hostess or hosting gifts over, we often do the bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. Um, we tried to bring something unique or interesting or that has a cool label (laughs) even Mm -hmm. too. And then we know that, you know, sometimes people will serve it right away at the party, but sometimes that's for their own collection too. And I do love just that it's the thought that counts, that someone has invited you over out of their, you know, out of goodwill and just wanting to spend time with you. And so the hostess gift also just reflects that and not to sweat it. What is grabbing onto your heart and why? This was the question posed by Father Mike Schmitz in one of his videos for the Ascension Presents series on YouTube. And as we'll see today, it's really one of the questions right at the heart of this whole discussion of detachment, right, Lindsay? That's right. So if we stop and think about it, detachment is often the root goal of so many of our prayers. And if we aren't Christian, it's the end goal of so much of the self-work that we're doing. We want to know why we're connected to some things, why we are attached to some things, why we're attached to some things more than other. Is it an unhealthy attachment? It really does seem like the root of everything else that we have to do is to find out what we are attached to and what we need to become detached from. Mm -hmm. Like uh, attachment to things and going further, attachment to too many things, it really is the thing that holds us back. Like it does Mm -hmm. feel like a chain thing, right? So even if maybe we don't use the word detachment, we'll often like uh, convey it in terms of like letting go or being set free or (laughs) unlocking the chains or whatever it is. But yeah, I think we all have this sense in us that too many attachments, um, especially if they're unnecessary or even unhealthy ones, Mm -hmm. is really not the path that we're meant to go down. So I asked my husband last night, You know, because before he became Catholic, he was Anglican and he had done his undergrad at a Baptist college. And I said, so in all of your other experiences of Christianity, have you ever talked about detachment? And Mm -hmm. he's like, no, because I really wanted to get a proper gauge of, is this talked about? Because I don't remember being talked about before I became Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you're right. I think it's something we all talk about without using that word uh Mm -hmm. it's very i find it's very much a catholic world word and in my research i found out um the early lutheran church really jumped onto the detachment idea as well Mm -hmm. um but yeah i think first like we usually do michelle we should probably define it so what do we mean by detachment Mm -hmm. Well, and you're right. Like it it was kind of an interesting thing to work to define. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed that it actually kind of, you need to understand attachment before you can appreciate right. detachment. Does right. that make sense? Yes, actually it does. Yes. <laughs> so even like when we talk about what is an attachment, it means that you're inclined towards a specific object or quality and to a specific degree, right? Mm-hmm. So ultimately I read on a psychology website that attachment is ultimately about control. Mm-hmm. And that control is often simply an illusion If we can let it go, we can unburden ourselves in a lot of ways. Uh, And then I went to one of our favorite priests, Father Ripperger, on YouTube, Mm -hmm. 
And he has a whole talk on detachment, but he made this distinction too. He said, you know, you have an attachment when it's hard to take something away or pull something away or have it taken away. And when he said that, I was just like, oh, yes. Okay. So for me, one of the things I would say I would be attached to is my phone, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I just have to lose it or lose track of it for five minutes to know that that causes me um, undue stress. (laughs) So I probably have an attachment to my phone. And so then when we flip into detachment, it's more of like, you know, a person can take it or leave it. It's not that you don't enjoy something. It's more just like um, you have what's called, I've heard it called, a holy indifference. Mm -hmm. It just means you're not fixated on a thing. And so I found those two definitions play off of each other, but they are really helpful to understand as we go forward into seeing how it can benefit us to pursue it a little bit more. That's right. And it can be physical material goods, like you're talking about with your phone, it can be an attachment, a disordered attachment to food, um, something Mm -hmm. I struggle with. It can be an attachment, a disordered attachment to a person, right? Somebody that's been hurtful um, to us over and over again in the past. So it can be relationships. It can be um, an attachment to pride, to sin, to the quest for money, like any vices like that as well. So it's anything that's holding us down. I was listening to one priest talk about it and he was comparing it to the giant in Gulliver's Travels who was being pinned down by these little things that the Lilliputans Mm. um, were holding him down by, this big giant who should be able to move. But they had pinned him down by a ton of little things, right? And, And so he went on to talk about holy indifference as well, which I love that you brought that up because that really stood out to me is that term. And so he really drew it back to Mary, Mary's fiat. And it's something that we've talked about a little bit before in the podcast, but Mary shows that holy indifference so perfectly when she says, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done unto me according to your word. There's total detachment Mm. there, total surrender and total trust. She's therefore able to do whatever God is calling her to do because she's not attached to whatever the human outcome is of that. So yeah, he, he introduced Mary as the perfect example of that. And then Pope Innocent XII, he also talked about holy indifference. And he said, I quote, in the state of holy indifference, we wish nothing for ourselves, all for God. We do not wish that we be perfect and happy for self-interest, but we wish all perfection and happiness only insofar as it pleases God to bring it about that we wish for these states by the impression of his grace. And lastly, St. Francis de Sales also talked about holy indifference um, in his book of the love of God. And he wrote, quote, we should seek to practice such indifference with respect to all that concerns our natural life, such as health or sickness, beauty or deformity strength or weakness, honor, rank, and riches. So also in all fluctuations of the spiritual life, dryness, consolation, and the like. Just keeping that holy indifference, that total surrender and trust to God and not being, again, held down, being prevented from being able to rise up and fly um, by these little attachments that we have. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, there's so much there. I know. (laughs) And that's saying something, though, because I think this is a really striking thought that even though it's maybe not something that's very mainstream, maybe it's never really been a mainstream topic of conversation. It is. It has always been there, this quest and this um, searching for meaning and what it means to be detached from things and what that means for the quality of your life. Mm -hmm. I was reading about the Stoics of Mm -hmm. ancient Greece, right? And they thought that pursuing detachment was the only rational response to the world. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That, you know, the things things can't be controlled if they are the product of either someone else's will or they're the product of nature. Like you're just never going to master control over those things. And so the Stoics believe that the only thing that you could actually do or control is your own self and your own will. So they would just practice this complete eradication within themselves of any emotional or egotistical response to what was happening outside externally in their lives. 
Yes. So they were clear to explain, like, it's not about disengagement from the world or not feeling emotions. But like Mm -hmm. you were saying, they believe that correct virtuous judgment and actions lead to contentment, but that has to be um, achieved through reason and through a detachment from ego, like you're saying. They Mm -hmm. also believe that when the soul reaches its purified state, there is freedom from emotion. So there isn't that being held. It's not not feeling emotion. It's not emotionlessness, but it's not being ruled by our emotions. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that's something that everyone throughout history who talks about this makes very clear, right? Like it's not this bland emptiness that you just walk around um, not engaged in anything in the world. Because we were made to be. Um, But yeah, it's almost like a proper ordering of things and a proper rational realization of the place everything is supposed to hold. That's right. In terms of importance. Um, And then because we are emotional beings, um, kind of training ourselves not to get swept away uh, and tempted to put lesser things to more importance when we feel emotionally invested in it. Well, it's right. There's a there's another Greek term. I don't know if you came across the term apatheia, and it's going to yes. sound familiar to us, right? Because of mm-hmm. apathy, but it's not truly what we would think of as apathy, which is more negative, right? It mm-hmm. was freedom from strong emotionality, like what you're saying. It it directly translates into without suffering or passion, and then that led me down. <laughs> that goes into yes. so many other rabbit holes, right? <laughs> there was Perfect. equanimity, yep, which is the <laughs> state of psychological stability that isn't affected by pain or emotional triggers. It is mm. a balanced mind. And then there was ataraxia, I believe I'm saying that right, um, <laughs> which is the robust form of equanimity, which is an ongoing state of freedom from distress and worry, freedom from mm. disturbances. And, and just drawing it back to the Catholic Church, a word that we use often, which isn't fully connected to this, but still makes sense, is concupiscence. Um, it's about, that really is about fleshly lust. Fleshly lust, Michelle. Mm, wow. <laughs> right. <laughs> but what that is, is it's a desire. It's our appetites. And when mm-hmm. those are out of balance or not properly ordered, it prevents us from making rational decisions. So that takes us right back to the Stoics and like how they want right. to make a rational decision or judgment that isn't rooted in emotionality. Yes, I love that. Um, it reminds me of when Father Ripperger was talking about these four areas of attachment that we can be aware of. And the first one he said was the one that you were talking about, which is the concupiscible appetite. Mm-hmm. And that is the physical. So food, bodily um, goods, etc. And Father Ripperger was saying that detachment here just looks like, for example, you don't really mind what you eat. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's the irascible appetite, which is emotional. So you can mm-hmm. be attached to an emotion, anger, or you know, getting vindication over something, and that can become a fixation for you. Um, there's also intellectual attachments, uh, which is pleasure about thinking of things in a certain way. Ooh. An attachment to your opinions. I know. No. <laughs> so <laughs> psychology today. So this corroborates so well with what father was saying. Psychology today mentions that psychologically holding on to an idea just because you have become attached to it mm. turns into anxiety. And wow. this really made me think about the culture that we live in right now, mm-hmm. because I've noticed that there's so much like digging our heels in like even further into the ground when it comes to how we think about a lot of issues today. And there's also an undeniable rise in struggles with anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was uh, intriguing to note the correlation between these two things. (laughs) So that's intellectual attachments. And then the final thing he mentioned is an attachment to your own will. Just, I want to do what I want to do. And Mm -hmm. that this most often uh, manifests as habits Yeah, we'll probably get into how we can strengthen our detachment. But one of the ways we strengthen our wills to do well is to try to form new habits. And that takes a lot of self-control and effort. So knowing these things that Father talked about, as we go back then and look at the history of the Stoics and everything like that, we can see how even they would have recognized that there are these areas that we have to be on the lookout for. And by the late Middle Ages, I was reading, detachment was talked about actually in terms of what's called contemptus mundi, 
which is Latin for contempt for the world Mm -hmm. or worldly things, in other words. And that this was actually a really central um, highlight in the spiritual classic, The Imitation of Christ uh, by Mm -hmm. Thomas Akempis in 1419. So I, I just think it's such an intriguing idea that there are so many different, even cultures too, right, Lindsay, who yeah. like really recognized and may have had different approaches to it, but really recognized the importance of not ignoring um, how we can get bogged down by our attachments. Yeah. So for something that we think very few people are talking about today, it yeah. does seem like it was something that was talked about all the time around the world through the they kissed through the world. And they were not a fraction as attached to material goods or anything like we are now. It's right. It's almost true. like this is a burying our heads in the sand type of situation, because it, you would think like who really could have been attached to so many things a thousand years ago? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. um, But it really does seem to have dominated a lot of the different cultures and religions and throughout history. Um, It is ultimately the concept of nirvana from many of the different Indian religions. It has many aspects. Nirvana has many aspects to it. But one of the main ones is liberation from attachment. And then I read this awesome quote from this American Buddhist monk named Bhikkhu Bodhi. And he wrote, and I quote, the real meaning of upekka is equanimity, not indifference in the sense of unconcern for others. As a spiritual virtue, upekka means stability in the face of the fluctuations of worldly fortune. It is evenness of the mind, unshakable freedom of mind, a state of inner equipoise, which is now my new favorite word, equipoise, <laughs> that cannot be upset by gain and loss, honor and dishonor, praise and blame pleasure and pain. So here's the thing. And I feel like we just want to make this really clear. Freedom from disturbance or emotionality does not mean a lack of disturbances or emotions, but rather a lack of uncontrolled response to those triggers, Mm. not being ruled by them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was looking into uh, even Taoism in China, Mm -hmm. right? We're, um, I know I'm, posted a little bit last week about classical conversations. It's our homeschool curriculum this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and this week, the history sentence was just about what year Taoism was founded by the philosopher Lao Tzu. And he has a quote that says, uh, quote, he who is attached to things will suffer much. He who saves will suffer heavy loss. A contented man is rarely disappointed. He who knows when to stop does not find himself in trouble. He will stay forever safe, end quote. And so that's even 6th century BC. Right. That people are talking about these things. And he was yeah. really popular. Like he, um, his philosophies spread really quickly through China. Okay, so to wrap up what we think is probably the longest definition of a a term ever (laughs) on our podcast, (laughs) Um, we'll bring it back to St. Ignatius Loyola, and he, you know, founded the Jesuit order, and it's really hard to Google detachment and not come up with everything from the Ignatian (laughs) theology, right, and the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. It is really a pinnacle of their society. So uh, there's a book of meditations called The Spirit spiritual exercises written by St. Ignatius Loyola, and it was written in 1528. The Jesuits used this book as the foundation for their society. Now there is a first principle, and it can be basically summed up as detachment. Now I stumbled across a PDF church bulletin, I believe written by a Jesuit priest for his parish, but I can't find the name of the priest anywhere. But this is what he wrote about the Ignatian practice of detachment. Quote, detachment means a healthy impartiality, a distancing, and indifference. The opposite of detachment is possessive attachment, a disordered clinging to things, attitudes, habits, and even people that do not bring us any closer to God. When one is so possessed by things, one cannot freely make a decision for God. So I think we have a clearer, clearer Mm -hmm. (laughs) understanding Mm -hmm. of attachment and detachment. And so now, Michelle, how do we become detached? Mm -hmm. Well, that is the question of the hour, isn't it? (laughs) So so now what do we do? (laughs) Um, You know what? I came up with a lot of like little hints and and tricks and stuff like that. Um, And one of them was to look for this tell. Um, which is that if there's any kind of a re- an emotional response to a thing, yeah. like sadness or anger, 
um, then there's likely an attachment there somewhere. This is what this is again going back to Father Ripperger. He says this as a, a little tip to tell if you have an attachment to something. Well, then you know, he says, where you should start looking deeper into why you reacted like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it will give you a sense of what you're attached to and why. And this is going to give you a better idea of where your own head is at in regards to many things in your life. And especially if it's a very unhealthy attachment, it can alert us more quickly as to where work needs to be done to be freed from this attachment. So this is, I would say, like a preliminary tip. So in order to actually um, practice detachment, you would have to first uh, navigate what exactly it is you're struggling in attachment. So I thought that was a really good uh, metric to gauge for yourself is, do I feel sad or angry in an undue way um, when something is taken away or when I lose something? Oh, that's so good. And that is really similar to what I had too as my first point. And mine was just to ask yourself, what are you clinging to? Like you have Mm. to do that work, right? Mm -hmm. So that same unnamed Jesuit priest I just mentioned, he suggests that we ask ourselves um, how we are clinging to things that limit our ability to choose love and life. We'll get into this a little bit more about how when we're detached from things, it actually gives us freedom, freedom to live better and freedom to love more wholly. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, that's that first step is, yeah, what am I clinging to? And I think the word clinging is really, really important here. You know, the Bible tells us over and over and over again that the world is temporary, that our possessions are useless, that they're holding us back, right? That we shouldn't hoard things. Um, We're warned repeatedly about wars and natural disasters and famines that will continue to strike mankind. But we're promised, we are promised that if we choose Jesus freely, and this again is where it comes into being detached from things so you can choose something, discern something freely, we're promised that not a hair on our head will be harmed. Now, Mm -hmm. before I was a Christian, I would have had a lot of issues with that because clearly lots of, you know, innocent God-fearing people are harmed, but that's because I didn't have a proper understanding of detachment. Um, And so what it really means, again, if we think back to all those definitions, it means that nothing really truly can hurt me, right? If you're properly detached, even if you're physically hurt, it is um, the ability to see beyond the current situation and to have our eyes always set on eternity. And that So it doesn't mean you're not going to be in pain. It doesn't mean those things aren't going to happen. We've never been promised that those things aren't going to happen, but it is a detachment from um, our ego and thinking that it shouldn't have happened to us and that we are undeserving of this. Um, And that really does help us, again, properly order our response and, and then how we move forward from something. Mm -hmm. I love that, that it's a perspective, right? And it's almost a lens that we need to train ourselves to see the world through. Yes. Um, And I I just love that idea of thinking, because you're right when you say that there are a lot of things that we don't control. And we talked about how attachment ultimately means control, wanting control over things. Mm -hmm. But we can practice even in our day-to-day life, like in little ways, Um, how, like what that looks like for us then, um, before it really comes down to the wire and maybe some of the bigger things in our lives that happen to us involuntarily. And this is one of the things that I thought of is to practice our favorite mortification. Uh uh (laughs) (laughs) Only not like our favorite. It's just that we talk about this a lot too in the podcast. Um, but mortification, it comes from two words in, in Latin, mort and fature, uh, and it ultimately means to make dead. Mm -hmm. So it's killing the passions that fall outside the realm of what's reasonable and what's appropriate. I thought that was a good distinction to make. So yeah, you know, it again, it doesn't mean you can't take delight in things. It just means that when you do, you're training yourself, when you do mortifications, you're training yourself to recognize that this is indeed simply an object Or it's simply a thing and you're enjoying it in proportion to its essence, basically, right? And in that sense, you are developing that muscle so that as we go through life, we may find ourselves more inclined to a better disposition to handle anything that life throws at us with that perspective that you talked about before. 
Okay, yeah, because whether we like it or not, we will be mortified. Like things will happen mm. to us, right? So there is such power and choosing to take on mortification yourself in, in, which I think is funny because it's also trying to let go of control. <laughs> so in some ways oh, right. it's like, well, I'm going to control <laughs> the mortifications that are happening to me, but it is when done with the right intention, a way, like you're saying to really detach yourself from instant gratification, from instant pleasure. Um, I, uh, well, one of my things here, and this leads in perfectly with this is that you have to ask yourself, like, what is my goal here? Like, you know, what mm. do I need to detach? from. So like, what is my goal? And so for me, I definitely have a disordered attachment to controlling the outcomes of things. And so when I step back and go, okay, then what is my goal in this? Well, my greatest desire as a wife and mother is that my family make memories that unite us in unconditional love and that we experience things together that lead us to heaven. So I have to let go of my attachment to controlling all of the little things that I can't. Um, and letting go of when they don't work out like how I expected them to. So like you're saying, if I offer that up voluntarily, if I choose little ways, like for instance, I don't plan the day. I let the kids plan the day or mm. my husband plan the day. That is an action on my part where I'm trying to actively detach from that control, right? But right. the goal is still the same goal is that we make memories and that we have all these wonderful things. Yeah. And I actually think too, just as a, a note about this mortification and denying ourselves in in practice and spiritual training um, mm -hmm. is one thing that my spiritual director encourages me to consider all the time, which is that the passive things that happen to you are actually probably the best form of practicing detachment mm. that you can choose, I guess, <laughs> yes. in, in a way, <laughs> if, yes. if that makes sense, right? So yes. yeah, we could you know, choose to do little things like um, say, you know what, I'm not going to have um, this treat or something like that, mm -hmm. because I like to train myself to not become attached so much to it. Um, but an even greater way to practice detachment is if something doesn't go according to my plan. Oh, yeah. And you just say, okay, we will regroup and we will redirect and not yeah. lose the peace and become attached to anger or entitlement, thinking that it should have gone my way. And, and so that is also another form of this mortification in attempt to practice detachment that I think uh, will really benefit us if we're even aware that opportunities to do that happen all the time, whether you want to or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, just recognizing it, right? Being aware yeah. of all of those. Because there are, it happens multiple times a day. But if we're not seeing it that way as a gift, as a gift of a chance to grow in detachment, um, it really can shape how we do handle all of those little things that happen to us throughout our day. Okay, so if we're now looking at like actual physical things like food or alcohol or our phones or any of those things, um, I think there's two steps. So we could first develop the virtue of temperance. Um, mm. if we're just needing to really try to strike that balance, the, um, you know, enough is enough and to just have enough. Um, there's also the Swedish principle of lagom. We've talked about mm. lagom before, which yes. is not too little, not too much. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then for us as Christians, it's more specific. It's getting all that we need from God alone. So it's just like knowing that that enough, that concept of enough is is God. Um, and so like, let's say you've been working on the virtue of temperance, right, mm -hmm. um, with this, but then you might need to go a little bit more when you're like, nope, I'm still being held down. I'm still feeling like I need to detach from this more. Well, that's when you can try fasting and you can fast from food or from alcohol or social media. Sometimes we do need to cut it off completely just for a little while in order to break that habit and to feel what that feels like. So yeah, you can start with temperance just a little bit, try to strike the balance. But if that's not working, yeah, maybe it's time for a bit of a fast. Mm -hmm. That's so good. I'm so glad you went into the virtues because I touched on virtue, but literally all I had was overcome attachments, pursue <laughs> virtue, exclamation yes. mark. That was it. <laughs> and now I know that that virtue is called temperance. So thank you for that. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> and I think the thing that is always, again, the most obvious that we often forget the 
the most is Mm -hmm. that we can pray for the grace to do this. You know, there's nothing that God wants more for us than to grow in this um, and to grow Mm. detached from all of the things that are holding us back from loving him as much as we can um, of giving all of our trust and surrendering to him. So it is a grace, this, this gift of being able to detach from things. And we have to ask for that. And he will help us with that. What we want is interior freedom. That's Mm. what this gives us, right? Freedom from fear and pride and sins and worldliness. Mm -hmm. And so we need supernatural help with that. Maybe maybe you don't. I need supernatural help with that. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, the very first thing, you know, is to ask God for the grace to detach from everything that is holding us back. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of a prayer from Father Mike Schmitz, actually. Um, He ended that little talk I mentioned before on detachment with a prayer that says, God, what do you want for me in Mm, regards to this thing? I don't want to hold on to it. I don't want it to hold on to me. I will only hold on to it if you have purpose for it in my life. If not, I want you to use it in a way that glorifies you and helps the people around me. End quote. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Can you actually put that in the show notes? Because I think yeah. I need to read that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I know. Me too. <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes. I'll print it out. Hang it on your <laughs> yes. mirror. All the things. Yes. yes, for sure. Okay. So one of the things we've kind of touched on throughout this episode is about how when you detach from things, it's freedom. That it gives you freedom to love properly, to love thoroughly, to love completely, to love the people in our lives that God has put around us and to love God. But I kept coming across this, this freedom, both in the Christian sources I was reading and the non-Christian sources. And they really did talk about this connection between detachment and loving freely. And it took me a little bit of time to fully grasp what this means, but it does make sense. So if I'm detached from how people respond to me, if I'm detached from what they're doing, assuming it's not dangerous, then I can just love them. I can just Mm -hmm. love them, right? That's it, period, full stop. If I'm detached from what the world tells me that I should look like, I can just love myself. If I can detach from all my issues around food and just enjoy the meal that's in front of me, I can really love that meal. I can be present in that moment. And if I can detach from everything that's separating me from God, I can fully love God. So it really makes sense to me that it's freedom. Really, mm-hmm. it is bondage. It is slavery. We're talking about the chains, right? And mm-hmm. it, it really is. So detachment, it was really an act of freedom. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Ignatian spirituality says, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Like what you're mentioning before, that it maximizes a person's availability to God and to their neighbors, especially exactly for the reasons you said. It gives such a clear and simple reason why this all matters, Mm -hmm. because the more our life is filled with things and, uh, you know, unnecessary or even unhealthy things, no less, Mm then that means you have less space for and less freedom for the things that really do matter. Our Mm -hmm. relationship with God, our relationship with those around us, and what we can do in the moment to serve those relationships best. And, you know, uh, one last point here from the American Psychological Association, they say that detachment actually gives objectivity um, Mm -hmm. as one of their definitions of detachment. And they say that it's the ability to consider a problem on its merits alone. So it's free of the emotion. It's free from baggage. And I can't think of a better way to approach loving and serving God and our neighbor than with complete freedom from any of those things. And so ultimately, I think I'm going to let St. John of the Cross finish this all off here (laughs) because he says it so well. Quote, in the twilight of life, God will not judge us on our earthly possessions and human success, but rather on how much we have loved. End quote. Okay, it's time for our What We're Loving This Week segment of the show. So, Lindsay, what have you been loving this week? Well, a few months ago, I finished the book, often considered the great American novel, The Grapes of Wrath. Now, the reason I didn't share it then as a what I'm loving thing is because I really struggled with how much I love the novel, considering the amount of blasphemy used in the dialogue in the book. Mm -hmm. So normally I would never proceed with something that had that much blasphemy 
but I really was bound and determined to finish the novel because the story is so gut-wrenching and I I could kind of understand the way the characters were speaking like that, why they were speaking like that. I will say though, and I just need to say this, that every time I encountered dialogue in the book, I would actually skim the page really quickly and then use my finger to cover the blasphemy. So that was, Mm. I felt like I was doing a little bit of something, but you were probably wondering, so what does this have to do with what I'm loving this week? Well, I finally saw the film, The Grapes of Wrath. And I don't know if you've actually seen, have you seen the movie? No, I haven't. Okay. Well, I was blown away. So everything okay it it skips a bit of the book which made me sad but it also skipped all of the blasphemy so Mm. it's not in the movie so then i have zero issue recommending the movie and had zero issue watching it so it was filmed in 1940 and it starred henry fonda as the main character and the novel and film follow the jode family as they join thousands of other people leaving the farming communities in rural america after a drought combined with over farming created that unique weather phenomenon of the Dust Bowl, along with the dissolution of the tenant farmer situation, as farming became more industrialized and as the new equipment meant that just one man could clear all of the fields, right, that he used to take many, many men to do. Mm. So these two factors plunged countless families into extreme poverty, like resulting in a lot of deaths. And a lot of them felt like their only hope lay in California, where they could be migrant uh, uh fruit pickers. And Mm. so a lot of them packed up all that they had left, right. And they headed West. So I won't say anything else. Um, but I just have to say, I do love Steinbeck and I really do see why this is considered one of the contenders for the greatest American novel and film of all time. Henry Fonda was mesmerizing as was Jane Darwell, who played his mother. And I kept thinking like it was only filmed in 1940 and the and what was really happening in history was only happening the decade before in the thirties. Mm. So it was so fresh in everybody's minds, just a powerful and moving experience. So I highly recommend the movie, the grapes of wrath. Mm. I remember reading it uh, on my own in high school, but mm-hmm. it has been so long. I couldn't tell you anything of what happened. So yeah. maybe it's time for a reread. Definitely. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And a watch. Um, Definitely and watch, watch the movie for sure. So what have you been loving this week? So I have been loving this production, which is also televised, um, called Queen Esther, and it's produced by Sights and Sounds Theatre in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So briefly for context, um, the story of Queen Esther, and I'm just quoting here from the Jewish Women's Archive, is that in the biblical book named after her, Esther is a young Jewish woman living in the Persian diaspora who finds favor with the king, becomes queen, and risks her life to save the Jewish people from destruction when the court official Haman persuades the king to authorize a pogrom against all the Jews of the empire. And now, so the show itself then, it was phenomenally produced. The acting was fantastic. And what I liked the most were the sets. Oh my goodness, the sets of this theater. So the stage is massive. It's 300 feet and it surrounds the audience from three sides. Mm. Um, the auditorium seats over 2,000 people. And, it, and the production often includes a cast of at least 50 actors. Um, they have state-of-the-art technology. And in some of their productions, they have live animals as a part of their plays. Um, and so it's really quite an amazing spectacle to behold. So this particular play I'm recommending today, The Story of Queen Esther, is really interesting. It's colorful, bright, it's really immersive, even watching it on TV from home. And I highly recommend renting it either from the Sight and Sound website, or you could invest in a yearly pass, which would uh, give you access to some of their other equally amazing productions. Okay, that's going to do it for us this week. If you want to get in touch and chat with us about our topic today, you can find us on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com or leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at The Modern Lady Podcast. I'm Michelle Sachs, and you can find me on Instagram at mmsachs. And I'm Lindsay Murray, and you can find me on Instagram at Lindsay Homemaker. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great week, and we will see you next time. Thank you.